Good morning from Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have the seventh episode of Neurosurgical Super Sunday, and we have the pleasure today of having Salman Sharif, a noted spine surgeon from Pakistan and conference organizer. Uh, before we, we turn over to Salman, let's meet some of the panelists. Good day, Adnan. Could you please introduce Good day. Yourself? Nice to meet you. Okay. Okay, good morning. I'm Adnan Mohammed, uh, neurosurgical resident in Egypt. Yes, for, for the second year. Nice to meet you all. Good morning. Okay, well, welcome, Adnan and Andrea. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Welcome. Could you please tell where you practice and stuff? Uh, I am uh, an Italian uh, uh, neurosurgery resident, third year in uh, Novara, near Milan. Okay, welcome, Andrea. And Slavin? Hello, Slavin? I'm Slavin. I'm a senior medical student from Zagreb. I am uh, also leading the Dandy Club here and uh, co cooperating with some neurosurgical clinics, and I'm really happy to be here. Welcome, Slavin. Yosef? Hi, Dr. Salman. Uh, I'm a final year medical student from Dom Medical College, and uh, nice to see you. Here, yeah, welcome, Yosef. And the Russian contingent, I don't know if you what someone can introduce. There you go. Hello. Do you hear me, Dr. Bennett? Yes, we do. We see you and we oh, hear you well. The Tumen Medical uh, Neurosurgery Center. <coughs> Maybe nice to see you again, and uh, hope we we can see you. But, uh, there aren't so many people today because it's some some kind of uh, celebration. Okay. This. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, and I'm John Bennett from uh, from Miami, and we'll turn it over to Salman. Welcome, Salman. Thanks, John, and it's uh, brilliant to be back on Neurosurgery TV, uh, the ACNS Super Sunday, uh, and it's good to see uh, so many of our old and new friends there. Um, I have um, some of my residents connected as well, but they didn't want to be on the panel, but they just wanted to see, so that's fine. That's what it does as well. Hopefully, next time, we should be able to have a scenario like what we had uh, about a month ago when we had the residents uh, in a conference room and we were able to do the same thing what the human people are doing. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's good to be with all our friends all over the world. Well, um, <clears throat> see the slides. John, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. I'm sorry. Yes, I was we, can. Yes, we can. Okay, so um, uh, although I'm a spinal surgeon, but um, I have a keen interest in minimally invasive brain surgery. Uh, one of my favorite uh, topic is endoscopic pituitary surgery. Um, I've been doing this for last uh, 12 years, and um, it's been some time since I've had um, um, any craniotomy for uh, pituitary, even if it's a giant tumor. Majority of them, we can get them out through the nose. So this talk is actually focused again for uh, medical students and residents. Um, uh, and the talk will focus mainly on giant uh, pituitary adenomas. But first part of the talk is uh, for patients to select how do we start, what do we do uh, with these giant tumors. Well, again, reading from Pakistan, as you know, it's a beautiful country. Um, this is uh, K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world. and. Um, this uh, lake is Lake Sefal Muluk, one of the highest lakes um, uh, in the world in the Swat Valley. Uh, this is an amazing part of Pakistan. Well, I'll be talking about tumors like these, which we see because patients, many patients come late and uh, many patients don't realize the problems they've had, or patients have an apoplexy and often all of a sudden the tumor increases in size. So these are giant tumors, which are more than um, four centimeter in height or um, then we talk about volume, so there are more than, um, we say, up to 20 um, milliliter in diameter itself. So these are different kinds of time tumors, but you know all of them are labeled as one, and some of them you may need to just do, if the uh, carotid artery is engulfed, you may not need to take all of it out from inside, you may need, you can leave some of the tumor behind, because you don't want to be risking these patients. But every patient that you do, you need to see the pituitary gland, where exactly it is. 
um, and uh, you need to know beforehand in order to have a good outcome, which is a good functional outcome from endocrine perspective. Um, obviously, it's done under general anesthesia with <coughs> intubation. Patients are kept supine with trunk uh, 10 degree elevated, but you can do various ways, whatever you're used to. I generally turn the head 10 degrees towards the uh, towards myself. And you have to have a uh, good friendship with, the, with your anesthesiologist, otherwise you could be in serious trouble. You need, you need to have controlled hypotension and um, excellent analgesia, because you don't want to be having mucosal bleeding while you're working with an endoscope without a speculum in the nose. Uh, position, obviously the inclination of the head in the vertical position varies as, uh, depending on the function of the anatomy of the lesion. For example, if the lesion is in the sinoid sinus or the clivus, the head is slightly flexed, whereas if the lesion is um, uh, in the uh, planum or suprasellar, then the head is moved to a neutral position or slightly hyperextended. The whole idea is you don't want your scope hitting um, the chest itself. Um, not sure if I'm okay here. One second. Yeah. Um, You're still on the first slide, Salman. Do you want to stay in the first slide? Uh, it's okay. We're still on the first slide. Oh, really? I, I, I think I'm moving here, but for whatever reason, I'm, um, can you see this? Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. So maybe I'll just stick to this and increase this slightly and go like this. And let's see. Um, throat packs are, have to be carefully applied by a senior anesthetist. Why senior? You don't want uh, these people to be having some kind of abrasions in the throat. Um, you don't want to be having... Uh, can you all see this? Yes, we can. Good. Um, and you, you want, don't want to be having an increased ICP or a CSF leak afterwards because of vomiting or coughing in these people. So, and you have your anesthetist need to suck the nasopharynx, oropharynx in the stomach in the end if you've had some kind of bleed that's gone through the throat pack. Obviously, you don't want to be selecting acromegalic patients when you're starting out. And the reason, because when you look at the preoperative MRI, you could see kissing carotid arteries in some of these um, acromegalics because the carotids really come close. Um, and bone is much thicker. The blood vessels are larger. They bleed quite a bit. The carotids are tortuous, and you may cause serious problems to the vessels. Anesthesia and intubation uh, is a problem, and postoperatively, you can have more bleed than usual in these acromegalic patients. So you should; these are not the ones that you should be starting out with. Uh, beforehand, when you do the MRI with macroadenomas, you know you need to see the lateral extension. You need to see the uh, shape of the sphenoid itself, the extension. Uh, how far down is it going? How far up it is going? Is it a dumbbell at waist? Has it got a supracellar extension or a cavernous extension? If the patient has got a hypo-intense T2-weighted MRI, that predicts hard consistency. Mm -hmm. You don't want that mm -hmm. to be happening because once you have that, you need to have a cavitronic ultrasonic aspirator. You need to be prepared that these patients, you may not be able to get the whole tumor out. So you can predict beforehand, can you or can you not take the tumor out? So when you look here, this patient has got a tumor which is going all the way into the sphenoid and get, then going up. And part of it is going into the third ventricle. Well, this tumor is slightly easier to operate on because half of it is below into the sphenoid itself already. So although it is giant, but at the same time, uh, the results may be quite good here because you know, you've got a plane to work with and you've got a uh, majority of the tumor already underneath and rest of the tumor falls down if you have your patients. Whereas patients like these, in which the carotids are pushed out, where the whole of the uh, cella is dilated because of the pressure, although it's going into the third, and obviously what's going lateral to the carotid will may be difficult to take out. You've got a bit of bleed there as well, and part of it is in the, uh, the uh, sphenoid, rest of it is going up, but you know, lateral extension is a problem here. So, you know, a bilateral approach is generally used for these macroadenomas so that you can use both nose nostrils. The instruments introduced through one nostril have a medial angulation reaching the contralateral, supracellar or paracellar portion of the lesion. 
Whereas um, uh, when you're coming from the other side, obviously your scope and your instruments can work below that. Narrow nasal cavities or anatomical variation may make the progression, progression to the uh, surgery be difficult. And in these patients, obviously, simultaneous use of both nostrils is really advantageous. And you can put in scope from one side or the other and or suction from one side or the other. And you can have four hands working together at the same time when you're doing these surgeries. A uh, soft tissue shaver works very well throughout and a thorough biting instruments may uh, just provide precise removal of the septal mucosa. These are the instruments that may save the bone or may save the mucosa depending on what kind of instruments you're using. You do a posterior septectomy with backbiters and you know, bionasal approach is easier on the cella and it prevents the septum from brushing against the endoscope. Obviously, uh, in patients in which we plan a flap beforehand, in which we think we're going to have a leak, in those patients, obviously, it's a completely different ballgame, which I will talk about later. Um, this is Amin Kassam and myself, and we are just showing that you know, if your hands are tied at your wrist, you won't be able to work. The same rule applies when we are working in the nose. So it's called a one-half rule. If you remove the entire half of the sphenoid, and you know, we, we, we take the sphenoid widely, go all the way laterally, so we can see both the carotids uh, quite clearly. And then we clear as much as down into the cella, about one half down in the cella, the clivus itself. And the idea of going down is because here, your scope lies on the top, uh, just above the plenum. And below that here, your instruments are gonna be working. So you don't want your instruments fighting with each other. So for example, a scope comes here, uh, the instruments from two sides can work underneath into the uh, cellar area and you can take the tumor out without causing any problems. Hadad flap, which has come out about 10 years ago, has changed the way we work because it reduced the uh, CSF leak ratio uh, tremendously and now that risk of, for example, if you're working in a planum with a meningioma, the risk has come down really down to less than 10%, which was up to 80% in a certain extent. And the idea is that you raise a flap on the uh, medial aspect of the septum onto the vessel itself. And it's uh, pretty simple and quite easy to do. It used to take a long time to our, uh, for our uh, uh, ENT guys, but now many times we do it ourselves and you can see the nasoceptal artery coming and your middle turbinate and inferior turbinate up there and the coana down here. And this is the uh, pedicle of the flap on which the vessel is, remains intact. And once you've removed that, you put this flap down into the coena, you do all your work up there, and once you have done that, you can bring the flap, and the flap basically protects any of the CSF coming down, and it's a, it's a very good anatomical uh, repair that you can do. Uh, I'm just going to briefly show how it works. So this is a, a Hadad flap, um, and if you see here, I'm sorry, that uh, we are removing this uh, medial part of the uh, septum, bringing it down all the way and putting that in it down in the coana, making sure that we, then we are able to bring another flap from the opposite side of the septum, turn it around and put it on the bare um, uh, nasal septum and the hood, just like that. So you bring it backwards and you put it on the side. So idea is that it blocks, um, uh, takes away all the crest that forms later on. and the uh, main flap that you take obviously goes onto the floor, um, onto the roof of the uh, sphenoid or wherever um, you want the leak to be stopped. Um, when you're doing this uh, pre-operatively, you need to see what kind of sphenoid septum there is and you know you, you do anterior sphenoidotomy and you need to go as far lateral as possible. You can use punches, you can use drill, whatever you're used to. Dura is opened in the routine fashion that we used to do with microscopes. So we use Doppler um, or a needle, whichever you have at home. Uh, Doppler is much safer, so you know exactly where your sinus is and where your carotids are on both sides and your sinus up and down, and you make an incision uh, depending on where, how big or how far you want to be doing. So with these metroadenomas, you need to have a complete exposure of all the four vessels on all four sides, and I'll just show that in a, in a later picture. So incision in the dura, you can do various ways. I would do a cruciate dural incision with the right angle dissector to find the subdural plane around the margin of the dura. 
And then if you want to be taking out these tumors, obviously when they're giant tumors, they're very, very difficult to take out via capsule. So these tumors you need to take out inferior lateral aspect first, allowing the supracellular tumor to descend later on. If you took out the supracellular tumor first, the diaphragm is gonna come down on you and rest of the tumor, it would seem like that you've taken all of it out, but the tumor would be lying on both sides and you will be in serious trouble. So this lateral portion of the tumor uh, has to be removed gently with blunt curettes to avoid damage to the carotid and cranial. And some people use Valsalva or injection of saline by lumbar drain to bring all this tumor down. Obviously, if you use removed the initial part, the central part or the superior part of the macroadenoma first, this diaphragm come, comes down and this lateral part, inferior part, and bit of the one run from the top won't come down. And you may think you have removed the tumor, but it's gonna be very difficult. And trying to resect that may cause increased risk of uh, CSF leak in these patients. And then use an angle 30 degree, 45 degree scope um, to look laterally and above and make sure that you've taken all the tumor remnant out and move forward. Repair is uh, performed with the purpose of creating a protective barrier and reducing the dead space and preventing the descent of chasm into the cellular cavity, which it will, because if you take out a big tumor, all of a sudden the whole thing will can fall down and cause uh, visual deterioration, which can happen. Um, overpacking of the cellar must be avoided. I've seen these people doing that and causing visual problem, and you may have to go back and um, take that pack out if the vision goes off in these patients, and you cannot just overpack, it's not possible. Uh, lumbar drain, obviously intraoperative uh, CSF leak, uh, if it's there and if it's a large leak and you've got a big area in which uh, you need a repair and you need that repair to hold, then lumbar drains can be helpful. Uh, closure, if you think it's not watertight, you think that you may be probably causing leak or there may be dodgy areas you, which you're not sure of. And an extended approach is sometimes we use lumbar drain. Hemostasis, well, um, if, um, if there's a bleeding and prolonged operative time and problems identifying tumor and normal pituitary gland is not seen, and all that is when you've got blood trickling down all the time. And you know, if you're experienced, you know where exactly the gland is, yeah, you can get away with it. But when you're not experienced, you're gonna abort the operation prematurely and that could, could cause a little tumor to remain and you may be causing serious problems or harm to the patient if there's a lot of blood hanging around. So there are tricks. You can have a warm water irrigation. You put your um, bipolar in ice cold um, uh, um, tubs. So basically the edge of uh, tips of the bipolar are kept in um, ice cold water. So once you're using bipolar, or they may be non-stick, but they will never stick again, and they will, they will work really well. And we do the same thing when we are doing phosphorus uh, um, tumors or brainstem lesions uh, that we are trying to take out. Uh, bone wax with patties works um, very well in, in instances when the lead is from the bone, and especially in the acromegalyx. And you can have xylocaine with adrenaline patties or cocaine patties or gel foam. Obviously, um, um, cotinide in patients is the way to go. In certain cases, we do use flow seal, but it's expensive. And in, in countries like us, uh, we have to make sure that we keep the cost down. Although flow seal works very well in certain cases, may be the way to go. So let's come to um, um, how endoscopy has changed the way we used to work. And can we, is it possible to take out more tumor and give better results to our patient when we are using endoscopy? So this paper came out in 2013 in Journal of Neurosurgery from McLaughlin's group, um, which is a David, David, uh, Dan Kelly's uh, group from uh, UCLA. And they had 140 patients and they uh, divided them into um, patients who had uh, uh, microscope-based tumor removal, endoscopic-based uh, tum uh, tumor removal. And they realized that you know, when they were using microscope and when they put the endoscope in later on, found that in one third of the patients, they were able to take out more tumor in which they thought they had finished uh, the case. In these 73 patients, um, uh, uh, this was shown in 2014 that the resection rate were up to 82% um, uh, in endoscopic surgery and gross total resection uh, was up to 24% uh, in patients with giant pituitary tumors. 
And you know, 73% had improved visual equity, and about one fourth would remain unchanged. Um, majority of these patients did not have any serious complications, and uh, they had statistically significant predictors that the resection rate was high if the NOS grade uh, was low or if the preoperative tumor volume was low. Obviously, the maximum tumor diameter, hemorrhagic component, posterior extensions, and sphenoid sinus invasion um, also decides how much tumor you'll be able to remove. So if you look at uh, surgically treated uh, uh, giant tumors, gross total resections were much better with bilateral endoscopic transthenoidal surgery um, with um, uh, comparing it with craniotomy or uh, with uh, a, a, a uh, microscopic-based transthenoidal surgery. And the results were completely different that your with bilateral endoscopic uh, surgery, the resection rate rate were up to 90% whereas craniotomy and um, microscopic-based transthenoidal surgery was only 60%. There's a huge difference here, and gross resection rate were much higher in these patients. So endoscopic endonasal surgery comparing with microscopic and open surgery clearly shows differences. And another uh, cohort uh, group of uh, patients literature review uh, with 478 patients showed that highest rate of gross total re resection was in um, endoscopic group compared to microscopic group. So huge differences here, 50% versus 10%. Visual outcome, much better with endoscopic group, whereas half of the microscopic group uh, improved. No post-operative leak um, in the endoscopic group in this particular area. And obviously, the perioperative mortality was high when uh, transthenoidal, um, uh, uh, when the transcranial uh, uh, surgery was employed. So endoscopic endonasal surgery, safe, effective, reducing the CSF leak, reducing, improving the visual outcome and uh, overall uh, survival in these patients. This is actually a picture from north of Pakistan, uh, a resort called Shangri-La, which is uh, all these mountains are in the range of 4,000 meters plus. And um, uh, I was there, I was lucky enough to go there last summer and it's an amazing spot uh, to be there. So I thought I'd just show this to you. Um, our own experience with giant facial tree adenomas, we have had 90 of those, and we have had um, the, these patients last were um, followed up a couple of years ago. We had um, uh, eye and uh, endocrine neurosurgery radiology opinion, resection rates uh, were assessed. Um, in these patients, 13 patients had two stage surgery when the extension was into the third, when they had a heart tumor, uh, when they had dumbbell tumor, and they uh, had not come down. Um, two of these patients required a CSF diversion procedure first when they uh, presented to us in comatose position. Um, the type of pituitary tumor um, uh, also uh, is shown here among these patients. So we had 16 patients which had functioning, uh, in which 10 were acromegalic, 5 were Cushing, and majority of these were non-functioning tumors. Um, so... Um, Sorry, I don't know if I can show this. Um, let me see. Can you see this clearly? John, can yes, you see this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We can so, see this clearly. So, you know, see this patient with the uh, acromegaly and a um, um, little bit of bleed on the top and extension going laterally. So it's NOS grade four. And if you look at Hardy's, um, um, if you look at that, and it's grade four as well, and this is post-op, and this is just done endoscopically uh, without any problem because majority of this was already down into the cella, move uh, tumors. So despite being dumbbell shaped, they are easy to do. It, is the slide moving forward here? Have you are you still on the slide, which okay. shows the yes okay. presenting symptoms is, is now. Yeah, I think I'm just going to stick to this. And if I have to show something, uh, then I'm going to move there. So if you look at these okay. nine patients with giant pituitary tumors, the majority of them presented with headache and visual deficits, um, and 10 of them presented with um, apoplexy and two in comatose, four in comatose stage, and two of them required CSF diversion procedure. Uh, visual findings were majority of the cases, as you can expect, uh, had problems, five had cranial nerve palsies, so if you've got a tumor like this, which is lying all in the cella and just expanding laterally, obviously they are easy to remove compared to a tumor that is arising uh, way above um, the sphenoid. 
um, and then going up all the way and causing problems. So adenoma height, if you look at uh, the 200 patients that we are looking at of those uh,